So when we think about game playing style, I think we all know about certain terms that describe how a team behaves when they're in possession of the ball. So you can think of some well-known styles like tiki-taka, where we would characterize this by short passes that are designed to re retain the ball. On the other end of the spectrum, you can think about things like route one, where teams tend to play the ball long uh, and directly up the field. Right? And so what we can get from this is that typical packings, passing choices that are made by players are somewhat indicative of style. I think there was a really nice article about this in The Athletic last year by John Lawler, where he looked at several box score statistics, mostly that were related to passing, and ran dimensionality reduction to try to come up with a map of different playing styles. And if we zoom into this map that he had up in this upper left-hand corner, we can see uh, things that are sort of tied together by the interest in retaining the ball. So we see things like Barcelona and all these things. And on the other end, kind of far away at the bottom right-hand side, we can see other teams that are known for perhaps playing more directly. Uh, and I think this is really nice work, but we also know that there are other factors that are really uh, influence what a team does when they have the ball. And namely, these are things to do with the game state. So we know that the current scoreline affects how teams behave. Are they winning? Are they losing? We also know how much time left in the match can affect this, right? So if you're down and it's late in the game, you're probably chasing. And whether you're home or late can also have uh, some effects. Of course, current work is ignoring this. Right? And so our goal then is to try to see whether or not we can incorporate information about the game state into these models. And our hypothesis is based on the following things, that there are three factors that affect uh, this passing behavior. One is the phase of play, so where the ball is. So think build up versus chance creation. The second is what passing of options are available. So think of the configuration of the players on the field. And the third is this game state, which is home away, current score, time remaining. So I'm gonna start by throwing away the game state and looking at how we can try to capture passing options based on phase of play and uh, what options are available. So what can we do independent of the game state? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build something based on Javier Fernandez and Luke Bourne's well-known soccer map model, which Peter adapted last year to work with 360 data. And the way that this works is it takes the current action as well as information for the previous two actions, and it's gonna build uh, several different features. So it's gonna struct features such as like the, the location of the ball, the distance from the, where the ball is to the goal and things like this. So we're gonna encode all this information in nine matrices, and we're gonna run it through a convolutional neural network in order to try to predict the probability that the ball is gonna get passed to each other location on the pitch, right? So this is the goal is we wanna to try to predict based on all this information that we have, uh, the location of the pass. And what this is gonna give then is a probability surface over the field. Okay, so how can we then try to bring back in game state to this? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two different approaches. So first what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to augment this soccer map model by adding in game state information. So that's the first idea. The second idea is we're gonna look at an encoder decoder approach to try to learn latent vectors that describe how teams behave depending on the game state. So let's look at this first thing. So predicting how the game state will impact a specific pass decision. So our task here is as follows. So we're given spatial temporal data describing the locations of the player in the ball. We know the identity of the team possessing the ball. And we have a number of contextual variables that encode home away, the score differential, and the time remaining. And what we wanna do then is based on all this information, try to predict this past probability map. So what this basically means is we're gonna augment the input data that we're giving to the soccer map model. And in particular, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a one-hot encoding of the team ID. So here there are 23 teams in the data set, so this is a 23, one by 23 dimensional vector. We're gonna look at home away as a binary variable. Now we have a one-hot encoding of the time remaining where we divide the game into 15 minute periods, apart for the last 15 minutes where we look at five minutes. And we're gonna look at seven different goal differentials ranging from minus three all the way up to positive three. 
And what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take this information, this game state information, and we're gonna use a neural network to, to compress it into a smaller vector. And then we're gonna add it into the standard information that we passed to soccer map. So we're gonna replicate this vector to add, get a more complicated matrix that we're gonna give into the convolutional neural network. But we're gonna compress this by applying one by one convolutions to try to integrate this game state information into each location uh, of the pitch. Under, with the intuition that the game state kind of affects everything, everything equally. And based on this modified uh, input data, we're gonna go through and we're gonna train a model to try to predict then the past location. So we've basically come up with a way to try to, to, to integrate this game state information into the model. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to ask some counterfactual questions to see how teams would respond when you alter the game state factor. So to give an illustration about how this might work, we can ask the question, how would playing at home, or how would the time remaining affect the pass selection? So here what we're doing is I'm showing uh, Liverpool, right? And what we're doing is we're holding everything constant. So Liverpool is possessing the ball. The game is tied. Uh, they're playing at home. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna contrast their expected behavior when this is the situation between minute 30 and 45 in the match or the last five minutes of the match. And what I'm then showing is a heat map that shows the difference, right? So the red indicates that they're more likely to pass to a location in minute 30 to 45, whereas blue means that they're more likely to pass to that location in the last five minutes of the map. And so what we can see is here they're possessing uh, the ball here. And early in the map, match, what they're more likely to do is to play something more conservatively and pass the ball backwards. Whereas when you go to the end of the match, this probability mass is getting shifted out to the wings and they're more likely to try to play something more aggressively uh, outside. So I think this somewhat corresponds to what we would expect a team to do uh, when they're perhaps pushing to try to win a match. The second thing what we wanna do is we wanna try to look at home and away. So here's an example for Arsenal. So again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold all the game state factors constant and we're gonna look at what happens when we vary home and away. So in this, what we're looking at in this configuration, Arsenal possesses the ball, the score is tied, the minute is between minute 15 and 30, and we're just gonna contrast their behavior or expected behavior between playing at home and playing at way. And so what we see is, again, a heat difference of heat maps. So red means that they're more likely to play a pass when they're playing at home. Blue are locations where they're more likely to pass to when they're playing away. And what we can see then here is that they possess the ball here out on the flank. but they're playing away, they're more likely to play a little bit more conservatively and pass, perhaps pass back to the goalkeeper. Whereas if they're playing at home, they're more likely to play a more aggressive uh, forward pass to the wing. So this is capturing some differences in aggressiveness of home versus away behavior early in the match. The second thing we want to look at then is trying to understand how the game state is going to alter a team's passing strategy. So what we're going to look at here is the following kinds of information. So what we're going to look at is we're going to train a soccer map model for every pass they play. So based on the configuration of the players, we want to know what's the probability that they pass the ball to each location. So we get a matrix, a heat map showing the passing probabilities, plus the pass that they actually selected and we're gonna know what team was in possession. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna trade an encoder decoder network to try, based on this information about the current configuration of the players and the pass that was actually selected in the team, try to predict what game state this pass was performed under. All right, so this is what this looks like, is we have our encoder decoder, so we take as input these two matrices, the probability surface, a mask for the selected pass and the team identifier, which is a very high dimensional vector. And we're gonna to try to compress this down using a neural network into a latent space that only has 16 different dimensions. Then we're gonna use a decoder to try to predict the game state. So here by game state, it mean home away, time remaining, and goal difference. We're actually gonna do this in two different ways. We're gonna to try to jointly predict all three different game state factors. So jointly predict at the same time home away, time remaining, goal difference. 
And we're also gonna take an approach where we try to do this separately, where we train one model to predict home away, a second model to predict time remaining, and a third model to try to predict um, goal differential. And what we can see then is we can uh, then get this encoding, this latent encoding for every single pass that a team performs. And what I'm showing here is we've run TSNE, which is uh, a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique to take these latent vectors and show them on a nice two dimensional plot. And I've colored each pass by the team that performed the pass. And so we can see different clusterings by the team. So the different teams' passes are pretty well grouped together. So Liverpool's down here, Arsenal is down here, and things like this. Then what we're gonna do is that we're gonna try to look at these latent vectors to try to understand how teams behave in different game states. So in particular, what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply a filter to select all these latent vectors in a particular game state. So for example, if we're interested in how teams perform in the last 15 minutes, versus the first 15 minutes. We take all the passes they performed in the last 15 minutes. We compute the mean latent vectors. We take all the passes they performed in the uh, first 15 minutes, compute that's mean latent vectors. We take the difference between these, and then we get some indication about how, what, kind of, what kind of differences arise when we contrast uh, their behavior in these different game states. Okay, so we get this. And what we can do then is we can look at things as follows. So the first thing we looked at is how much do teams change their style between the first and last quarter of the match. So here we're looking at first 15 minutes versus last 15 minutes. The most stable is shown at the top. The least stable is shown at the bottom, right? So as you go from top to bottom, we see more variant variation in how teams are form uh, versus home versus away. What we see here is that uh, Fulham maintains a consistent playing style throughout the entire game, right? So they're at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, Bournemouth and Liverpool tend to play differently at the beginning of the game and the end of the game. And the other teams kind of fall somewhere in between. And we can do this for other questions that we might have as well. So the second question that we looked at is trying to understand which teams vary their style most between home and away matches. So we did the same thing. We computed this average vector when they average pass vector for their home passes, we've computed it for their away passes, and we looked at the difference. And again, we can get this ranking. Again, I'm showing most stable at the top and least stable at the bottom, right? So as the bottom, teams alter their, their passing behavior more based on venue. And here what we see is that Aston Villa are the least dependent on this home away conditions, whereas Bournemouth tends to be more effective uh, by whether they're playing home or away. All right. So to wrap up, um, so first off, a team's playing style can be strongly affected by the game state. So whether they're playing home away, whether they're winning or losing, and how much time is left in the match. What we then looked at is different ways about how we could try to incorporate this game state information in playing style analysis. And we looked at doing this in two different ways. First, we took a specific approach to try to predict how, use the game state to predict how it would affect what passing option is selected. And the second thing is we took a more generic approach to describe how the game state will alter the team's overall passing behavior. I think we, we concluded based on doing this that trying to isolate the effect of the game state is actually an incredibly hard problem, um, mostly due to the imbalance, right? So most times the goal differential is zero, zero. And so we have a very skewed problem domain we had to come up with lots of different ways to cope with this. Namely, we had to subsample sub the data from the most common game state, and we had to try to fiddle with the loss function that we used to train the neural network to get this to work. Secondly, it turned out to be much harder to try to predict all factors of the game state simultaneously, right? So it was much easier to try to train one model to predict whether the pass was home away, a second for time remaining, and a third for goal difference, as opposed to doing it jointly. And I think, uh, you know, in the future, our conclusion is that the, the signal and the data is very sparse. And I think our, our kind of takeaway from this is that we're probably operating on the, on the wrong granularity here by using these very fine-grained pass maps. And we really need to think about an alternative way to try to represent these in a more uh, higher level manner, whether that be using a more coarse-grained grid or something more qualitative. All right, 
so yeah, this was joint work with lots of other people, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. I think that was excellent. Um, from a practical point, you mentioned there's this assumption that the game states affects uh, the whole field in a similar way. Yeah. I feel this could be kind of assessed some way, so I was wondering if you guys had any hypothesis whether this stands true or, or not. I think that's a great question um, because you could imagine that this that, that this would would um, this could be somewhat location dependent. Could we determine this in some way? Um, I guess the f the first thing that would think in my mind is you could think about trying to trying to see how the the loss or the the predictive power changes as you kind of integrate this information asymmetrically. So now we do it very symmetrically. And we could try, try to do this in, in an asymmetric way and see if this allows us to learn a more or less accurate model. And I think this would give us some indication about uh, whether this is a valid assumption or not. I think that's a great question, Mark. Yeah, thank Thanks. You. Hi there. Um, thank, you, thank you for that. Really enjoyed that one. So I think the question I sort of have on the back of this coming from a team perspective is that people are going to want to know, OK, the game state has changed now. We're winning or we're losing or something's mm -hmm. happened. And uh, what can we do to influence either maintaining that lead or reverting it, right? So, so obviously, you did a really good job of showing Unai Emery keeping with the same strategy consistently the whole game versus you know Brentford changing up their strategy depending on some of these states and, and things that are going on. Uh, but I, I was wondering if maybe that's a, a something you guys had talked about. And having looked at this data, if there were either characteristics or strategies that you saw that sort of either led to these change in states or, or could manipulate it in some way? I think that's a great question. That is actually not something we thought about. And I'm actually wondering if this would be the right approach to investigate that, right? So I guess basically you want to try to understand maybe how these, these changes affect, you know, the chances of winning or losing or, or things like this. Um, and I'm not. I'm not sure that how we approach this would allow you to directly answer answer that question. Um, I don't see a way that I could answer that. If that's the question, I don't see a way off the top of my head that this would work. I think you would really have to have something much more like a simulation framework to to be able to play out alternative scenarios. But I think that's a. I think that's a great point. And I think it would be very interesting to see if you could tie back some of this to some more high-level concepts. Mm -hmm.